Hi, Cam. Welcome to the podcast. Great to meet you. Great to meet you. What a book this is. I was just talking before we started recording, if there's ever been a book written about Skip Spence, and there hasn't, right? Mm -hmm, that's right. Yeah. Amazing. And you, the story of Skip Spence, though, a lot of, there's a lot of myth, there's a lot of truth, and you talk about it at the start of the book about how it's a challenge to determine what stories about Skip are true, what stories are myth. This is a quote from your prologue. Mm -hmm. to, un to untangle the myth from the truth, we'll need to trek through the narrative of his life, writing the turbulence along the way. How much of a challenge was that for you in the process of writing the book? And how did you go about telling his story? Oh, um, great question. So um, the books, I, I wrote a book about Moby Grape years ago. And uh, I befriended and got close to Don Stevenson, who lives in Toronto. And he was the drummer and one of the vocalists in Moby Grape. And Don was doing a show in um 20 um 28 2019 and uh so it's a year after the moby great book came out and don was doing a show at a dinner theater and i was um going to do some speaking on stage and so we brought um omar spence over omar's skip's son and one of his sons and omar uh sings and plays the guitar he's a great performer so Omar came over and he stayed at my house for a few days and we did like a tour of Toronto and looked around and stuff. And at one point, uh, during one of the nights we were chatting and we were talking and at one point Omar mentioned that he felt a little, you know, sad that there wasn't a book on his dad and his life wasn't captured in print. Articles, yes, but not in a book form. And so that's when I got this idea, like, well, let's let's make this happen. So I wrote a pitch deck and um, sent it out to different publishers. And Omnib I got the news, actually, I was in um, so 2019 in the summer. And I got the news when I was in Toulouse, France at a conference. And I got the email that Omnibus Press was interested. And so I started writing uh, like a machine in, in August. I started to get to know other family members, especially Skip's sister, Sherry. And, um, you know, you have to build trust with people. I, so I, I do other kinds of research as well. And I do qualitative research. So it's uh, interviewing people and particularly interviewing people over a long period of time. So you're conducting many interviews and building trust. And so that, um, that led to me writing very quickly between the summer of 2019 and um, when COVID hit. And so I wrote about 90,000 words uh, that I knew was going to be edited uh, between August of 2019 and March of 2020. And that was writing basically up to the point where Skip um, had, uh, it was up to the point of Granite Creek. So Skip would have been um, about 25 years old at that point. And his life, he had a breakdown in New York City when he was... Um, 22 it was in, in 1968 and so i wrote up to the point where he was 25 and then covid happened and writing became difficult and it was also difficult at that point to write about that point in his life because skip was um on the street self-medicating uh for periods of time and he was he lived on the street for a while he was in and out of hospitals so actually um, it was very tricky, and I, it was also tricky for me psychologically to wrap my head around that I've written 90,000 words of the, this guy's first 25 years. There's so many things happening here. He was in Jefferson Airplane, Moby Grape, and he, he played in folk clubs before that. And so then I was intimidated, like, how am I going to write about the next um, 26 years of his life, 27 years of his life? And um, so I, I wrote more slowly at that point. And so it was very tricky. This is a project that's almost five years in the making. Wow. And um, yeah, so so it's it's been tricky, but it's been fascinating. I tried to interview people in chronological order. So I was trying to follow the footsteps of his life. So like one of the first people that I was really talking to a lot was Sherry, who um, shared a lot about their childhood experiences and their parents. And so as I interviewed people, yeah, I interviewed one of the members of Jefferson Airplane. And so that was later on when I got up to the point where Skip was a teenager because um, they they were playing in folk clubs together before anybody was famous in the South Bay area. 
Well, that's I want to start with the childhood years and, and knowing the mm -hmm. mental health struggles that he had as an adult. I wondered how much of it came from his childhood. You always look back to that. But it didn't seem, I mean, it seemed like a fairly normal child, a lot of moving around. That's right. for sure. But yeah. uh, you did, and you did write his, his sense of abandoned and carefree nature was, were yeah. forged in his early years, but there right. didn't seem like any clear warning signs. No, no. He was, um, he was very um, almost cavalier and he had a kind of approach where um, he, almost like he had a sense that everything is going to work out. And for, for a portion of his life, it did. Right. And so, you know, he's rehearsing with the band that eventually became Quicksilver Messenger Service, and he got recruited into Jefferson Airplane. So that worked out nicely. And then he goes off to Mexico for a while, and he, he misses some things with the airplane. And so he exits the airplane. And But at the same time, um, maybe he was ready to, because he was a lead, he was able to be a lead singer, and he was able to be a frontman. He had a lot of stage presence. And so behind a drum kit, he, he couldn't do those things. So leaving the airplane the way he did, it actually worked out really well because then he formed this band, Moby Grape, that was like the 1927 New York Yankees. There's, there's like a, a stacked team with so much talent. And if you look at sports teams that have that kind of talent, it's always hard to hold them together, certainly like since the era of free agency and everything. And um, back in the old days, it was easier to hold those teams together. But now it's much trickier too. And, you know, with the rock band, they're like free agents. They can do what they want to do. And remember at that time, Moby Grape had started in, in um, 66, the very late summer of 66. And there, there's no, I guess the Beatles might have been the template at that point for like longstanding bands. And even though the Beatles had, you know, um, John and, and Paul had known each other, you know, since 57, I believe, and so when you get to 66, those two had been together for nine years. But really, as a as a recording unit, the Beatles, if you're in 66, they've only been a recording unit for a few years at that point. So there isn't really this template for a long history of a band. And so Skip did a lot of moving around. He played in folk clubs, um, as I said, prior to uh, joining the Jefferson Airplane. And he dabbled in different kinds of things, different styles of music. And you saw that throughout his life later on. Um, as well, like when he um, played the song that he wrote for the reunion album, 20 Granite Creek. Um, so Skip moved around a lot uh, himself, and this is kind of replicated in his really um, uh, cavalier and, you know, he had this real zest for life approach and things you know that things will work out. So like it worked out with Moby Grape. There's one point where he got this royalty money um, uh, his his uh, his ex wife Pat remembers. You know, there, there's royalty money, and he gives it to uh, these neighbors who are short of money <laughs> right around Christmas or New Year of '66 or '67, and she's like not happy with this. This is like money that can be used for functional household things, but skips doing this to help other people, and so he's not really always thinking about the. Um, most practical things, but for a long time in his life, it worked out. And of course, it, the moment it didn't work out was in New York City in June of 1968. And all of a sudden things, you, he had a breakdown and uh, he ended up in Bellevue. And it must have been um, absolutely devastating. I mean, it was devastating for the people around him. So it must have been absolutely devastating for him to have this happen, this young rock star so talented the band is not um selling albums the way columbia had hoped but they're putting out great material their first album uh, that came out in 67 is is a brilliant album and the high points the high water marks of moby grape's second album you know i uh, i would say like they 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 equal the high water marks of the first album you've got absolutely brilliant music on the second album it's not as consistent as the first album and and it's when they're trying to get ruling on that third album when skip has a breakdown and he's in bellevue for months and months and he kind of redefines himself when he leaves he goes by the name alexander which is his proper name um uh, you know his given name and so he's not going by skip anymore when he gets out and he records this album that has absolute cult status now where he re he plays all the instruments um an album that also shows 
um, the different sides of Skip. Like there's the song Lawrence of Euphoria, which is um, comedic and fun. And then you've got very dark songs on it as well. So he was a person who uh, had extremes, but he had this kind of sense of, I think, hope that or expectation that things would work out until that moment in um, the uh, June of early June of 1968. I, that second album, I thought of the Doors soft parade kind of, there was experimental, there was, mm -hmm. it was you know, with the instrument instrumentation and, and like you see a little uneven at times, but there's some mm -hmm. really, really good stuff in there. Yeah. But, but it's surprising that that first album didn't have any hit singles because there was that potential. Like they could have, they, that's what's amazing about Skip Spence and even Moby Grape. It's like you have all these bands like uh, Jefferson Airplane or all these bands from there that may, maybe have one big hit single and they maybe get more notoriety than Skip and Moby Grape do. But you talk, like you said, it's like the 27 Yankees. I mean, they could all sing mm. and I think they could all write songs. They, they could. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was like this phenomenal lineup. Yeah, absolutely. The, for the first album, um, somebody decided to put out five singles at the same time yeah. and um they they you know it's like it's like with the oscars if you get two people nominated from the same film they kind of cancel each other out with the voters and uh, this is like having five well five at least with five you'd have one person win if they're nominated for the oscars but what ha what happens is you have five singles by one band people didn't know what to play and had these singles been um uh put out, you know, every couple months, you know, every six weeks or something, every every two months, they, they, they could have um, gone into the higher reaches on Billboard. But unfortunately, the only one that really um, got onto Billboard, one of them was on the Bubbling Under uh, chart. And and Omaha, though, was the one that did make the Hot 100, right. but it only got up to number 88. And which I mean, is, this song could have it's easily been top. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a top 40 yeah. single. It's yeah, mm -hmm. that that's crazy, crazy. I went, going back to the the sixties folk scene, like that Bay Area folk scene that Skip was part of. He's hanging with guys like Jerry Garcia, David Crosby. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all those guys are part of that scene. It's around this time he tries LSD for the first time, and you mentioned mm -hmm. in the book this was this is when he makes a switch from folk to rock music. It's mm -hmm. LSD that played a a part in that. Well, this, it, they happen right at the same time. So this is, um, so I, was, I talked to these two brothers. Uh, they had a band called People, the, uh, Jeff Levin and Robbie Levin. And uh, Skip was chummy with them before People formed or right around the time People was forming. And when Dylan went electric, that was a big thing. That was like getting the green light for a lot of musicians to pursue, uh, you know, going electric. I mean, there were the purists who were not, for that at all but skip was one of the people who like really embraced this idea of pursuing electric music and skip loved uh, you know some bands you know like the the stones and later on the who and so he embraced that it was right around the same time right and so this is right before um he goes into the airplane and he's pursuing now rock music and experimenting with lsd wow yeah that's the 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 fact that he's a drummer on that album too we don't know how much he played drums before then he, he right. pretty much picked it up like boom how did he join yeah. jefferson airplane that's that's what i wanted to so answer. that's why he was rehearsing at this club called the matrix which used to be a, a pizza joint that like the build this building or uh, the unit used to be a pizza joint and um marty balin who is sort of the leader of the airplane um was a part owner of this club. And uh, so he had some entrepreneurial skills and uh, inclinations. And so he was involved in uh, setting up the club and Skip was just rehearsing. And he St Skip had such presence that Balin was prompted to go and approach him. And at that time, Jefferson Airplane, they'd only been around for maybe a month at that point. So this is early September of 1965 and pre gray slick era yeah imagine. absolutely that's yeah. right and so balen um invited skip into the band the, the snag was that he had to switch the drums and skip was um i think a bit apprehensive but he he did it he, he embraced many different instruments and so he he picked up the drums and within 
about a week he was performing with the airplane and they went down to LA. They were um, recording for Phil Spector. They did an audition with Phil Spector and they started. So this is now in mid to late September of 65. And then come December, they're recording their uh, first, they start recording their first album uh, down in LA. Jefferson airplane takes off, which was yeah. due out in August of 66. Sometime that spring, he goes to Mexico and you mentioned that. Yeah. Now, yep. he goes there for an extended holiday, doesn't tell his bandmates, and he's fired. At least that was what Marty Balin has said. Is yep. that what happened? Well, there, so so whenever you look at things that happen in the past, um, you're, you, you can access documents when they're available, if, as if there's anything available. And and then, of course, you can go with talking to people and getting their personal narratives. And so when I couldn't get to people, I would go to available interviews. And so Balin's talked about it. And you you get slightly different stories from different individuals. And they're not even purposefully, of course, giving different stories. They might remember things slightly differently. Whenever we go into our long-term memories, we're accessing the last time we talked about something. We're not going back to the original events of the experience. So he he disappeared. He was a kind of um, MIA for, for a little while. And this is right around um, May of 66. And so it's possible that he had, that he frustrated Balin. There's, there's an interview um, with... Uh, Skip and Bob Mosley from 67 and Mosley in the interview um, indicates that there might have been some kind of friction or uh, a bit of friction with Marty Balin. And that this could have been because Skip was MIA. Certainly Skip was um, loved enough by the band to take part in their second album, Surrealistic Pillow. And so he's a guest on that album. And, and the kickoff single is a song written by Skip, my best friend, too. So it wasn't like so acrimonious that they would never work together again. But I, the other thing is that possibly Skip might have felt um, it's OK if I leave the band because I'm, I am I don't want to be a drummer. I'm not meant to be a drummer. He was a front man. So that that's and again, I'll thing. land on my feet. I'll be fine. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So Moby Grape forms summer of 66. He mm -hmm. and the manager, Matthew Katz, they're looking to form a new band. Eventually, the band is formed. Peter Lewis on guitar and vocals, which, interestingly enough, his publicist, I'm trying to get an interview with Peter, and I don't know if it's going to happen now, but it'd be very interesting to talk to him. It was just interesting timing that uh, this book came out, and I don't know, maybe we'll talk to Peter, but Jerry Miller on lead guitar and vocals, Bob Mosley on bass and vocals, Skip on rhythm guitar and vocals, and Don Stevenson on drums and vocals. I think I got that right. It's a whole lineup, right? Yep. So yep, every right. member could write music, as we said. Now, it was either Skip or Bob who came up with that name, Moby Grape? Not Correct. sure? Yeah. Okay. Where does the name come yeah, from? Yeah, not sure about who, but in, in court documents, it it's indicates that it was one of those two. Yeah, and the name came from, uh, it was like a joke that they were making about Moby Dick, right? Yeah, yeah, and it was a kind of joke that appeared in newspapers. I was trying to find the newspapers in San Francisco. I couldn't find it in the San Francisco newspapers. In, in, so I was looking for examples of that in, in the um, months of uh, July or August of um, 66, but I couldn't find um, Bay Area newspapers, but it was certainly in a bunch of newspapers in the mid-60s, that joke. I was just talking with somebody about bands these days where you have two versions of the same band. You know, you get Great White and then you get uh, Jack Russell's Great White. And I said, well, there's a band, Moby Grape. There was one time when there were two Moby Grapes at the same time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, right. it's, it's October 10th, 1966, an important date in Moby Grape history. Talk about the, the contract addendum that Matthew Katz had Skip and his bandmates sign and how that haunts them in the years. Yeah. Ago. Yeah. So, um, this, uh, when Kate split with um, the Jefferson Airplane, it was really acrimonious. And he, uh, him and Skip were together, and he um, helped put together Moby Grape. I mean, there were different, slightly different iterations of the lineup before they landed on that final five that they had. And they they signed this contract, and, yeah, I mean, it haunted them for, for years. It went into the next century. It went past Skip's passing. And they didn't resolve it. They were fighting in court over, you know, who owns the name of the band. They're fighting over access to royalties. 
um, money that people should have gotten. And so it all stemmed from things that were signed in uh, September and October of 1966. The part they, they split with Cates in 67. So they, they basically were with them on and off because um, there was uh, some bickering during this time, but they were with him for about a year and he was fired in um, September, around September of 67. And they replaced him with Michael Gruber. And at that point, Cates had started setting up his own um, sort of performance space up in Seattle. And in late 67, a couple months after he was fired by the grape, he started advertising Moby Grape coming soon to his performance space, um, San Francisco Sound up in up in Seattle. And, you know, you know it wasn't going to be Moby Grape, <laughs> the Columbia recording artist Moby Grape. And so he starts advertising this in late 67. And in 68, on the Ides of, ironically, on the Ides of March, this is the first documented performance of the what has come to be known as the fake grape. And this is Kate's touring uh, an alternative Moby Grape. And um, they they toured for, for a while, like for months they were touring. And that is part of the, uh, Kate, at that point, Kate's was claiming that he owned the name. And in... Um, in October, uh, no, actually, early November of 68, uh, so a year after he'd been fired, he sued Moby Grape for a million dollars. And by that point, Skip was in Bellevue. So I don't know if Skip was, uh, when he would have been aware of that, but he was in Bell Bellevue at that point that the lawsuit started. And it didn't end until the 2000s. And the, the band had to persevere for decades and the decade after decade and they couldn't use their name at different times it was like whack-a-mole like they would try using their name but then they would get served or they'd get threatened and then they'd have to change the name use a slightly different name it was um it, it was a kind of like a, an odyssey of a, of a lawsuit so probably you know it is the longest music lawsuit in history because it was we're talking almost four decades that's amazing. And so Cates, and I was saying cats, it's Matthew Cates. So Cates, right. that, that lawsuit, did that also play a role during that second album? Mm -hmm. Wow. Grape, right. Wow. Slash grape is a great jam. Sorry. Wow. Great jam. Slash yeah. grape jam. Yeah. They start noticing some, the moods are up and down. Skip's moods are up and down and, and, and the drug well, use is picking. I mean, there was a lot of things going on at the time, but did yeah, that contribute so to his, his, uh, so like with the second album, they, um, they they recorded that first album really quickly. And uh, the thing with that first album is that they started playing together in the very late summer of 66. And they had a lot of material that they brought to, to the table, all, all the members. So Don and Jerry were a songwriting partnership. Peter wrote his songs, Bob wrote his songs, and Skip wrote his songs. So you, you had five members who were all songwriters, but it was kind of like four different songwriting, I guess, teams or units in the band, um, slightly with different configurations at times, because Skip did write with Jerry and Don when he uh, had a hand in adjusting a song that they brought to Moby Grape. So they had all this material for their first album. It was really well rehearsed by the time that they walked into the studio for the first time. And so they were able to record that first album in a handful of days down in LA, just doing quick jaunts down. They go down for like a week record for a few days in the studio. And then they go back up to San Francisco or they, they were living in Marin County. And then they they did that in, in March and April. So recorded in a handful of days and released in June of 67. What happened was Columbia put a lot of money into promoting Moby Grape and they shot themselves in the foot by putting out those five singles on the same day. And so the, the, um, the, the, the sales did not match what they wanted or what they expected. So they put Moby Grape back in the studio a couple months after the first album came out. So in August, they were sent back into the studio. Uh, they, they were give, they were, a place was rented for them down in Malibu so they're staying down in Malibu recording and um, the sessions, they, they got some things done. And this is in August now of 67. They got some things done, but um, 
they weren't moving as quickly as that first album. The other thing too is they it would have been better if they'd been given more time to write the material and sort of not been hurried back in the studio so quickly touring to you know kind of give them a little bit of buffer time to tour off that first album and write some material for the second album so they so they went in the studio in august they did record a few tracks but um not an album's worth so then they were moved to new york in november of um 67 they had a lot of material it's interesting because they went back into the studio um i believe it was on November the 6th it was on, on the first Monday in November and they recorded a whole bunch of demos in one day and a bunch of those demos did not go on the album and uh you listen to them and you wonder why didn't those album why didn't those songs go on the album now some of those songs went on later albums but there, there are a couple certainly like Skip had two on that day that got cut and one is a song called Seeing uh, which has been covered by Robert Plant. And another one is called You Can Do Anything. And both of these songs are are wonderful songs. Seeing is um is an epic. It's like a kind of um compact epic in a sense. And um what did Brian Wilson called uh um Good Vibrations like a pocket symphony. It's kind of like that, like this like compact song that has so it's uh, epic in nature. And so he had seeing the template for seeing the vision for that song all put together and he had a song called you can do anything uh which is this great catchy song and it sort of captures skip's look at life uh his uh carefree nature and his whimsical uh way of writing lyrics at times and so they had all these songs in november cut all these demos and a lot of them didn't make the album they finished a couple songs in november and then they put the album on hold and they went back to it in January. And when they went back to it in January, there was um, there was a time where Peter took a break from things, Peter Lewis. And so um, they half of that album, as you mentioned, right, there's the wow part, which is like a proper album. Then there's Grape Jam, which is this uh, series of songs that are jams. They're improv songs that they played, um, a lot of them very jazzy. And that was not... Um, in Peter's wheelhouse and not very much in Skip's as well. Skip, the Grape Jam album doesn't feature Peter on it as, at all on that desk. Skip plays on one of the tracks. He plays keyboards on one of the tracks. And so what, what we had in January, middle of January to middle of February now was this last leg of recording their second album. And they're away from home, away from their families. They're in New York and, and, and gigging too, like playing in Philadelphia and playing, um, in in the area but uh with the grape jam there there's a kind of tension partly with that in the band and i think also some tension with being away from home for so long and so the second album sort of reflected that in a way and skip brought new material when they went back to new york in january of 68 skip brought these different songs now um some of so funky tonk is a um co-written one that is kind of um, playing with a play on country music. And so there's a section where Bob Mosley sings a bit and his voice is uh, sped up. And um, Skip does this homage almost to like the style of music that his dad used to play because his dad was um, a performing professional musician and um, like a crooner kind of musician. It could play beautiful songs, beautiful um, music. Yeah, you know, and I forgot to mention too. He grew up in Canada, right? He wasn't. He was born in Windsor. Yeah, he was born yeah. in Windsor. He's not. He's not um, a West Coast guy to start with. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, he, he was born in Windsor. Um, they made their way down eventually to uh, Phoenix, Arizona. His Skip's grandfather worked. Um, he was an immigration officer in Windsor, right at the border with Detroit. Windsor is like the one place in Canada where America's to the north and Canada's to the south, and so uh, the his dad his grandfather was an immigration officer and his grandfather had tuberculosis um he eventually passed of tuberculosis in i believe it's 1960 and and his his grandfather um married a second time and had a, a younger family like i had a child with his second wife and so skip's dad had a younger stepbrother who was quite a bit younger than him so skip's dad eventually moved to windsor but his grandfather um skip's grandfather moved down to phoenix at one point with his um, 
the second wife and, and, and younger child, perhaps because of the tuberculosis. Um, it's a lot easier, you know, in a sort of warm, dry environment. Canada's very cold and um, damp. And so he was down there and he worked in, in a hotel and he was um, not exactly like a concierge, but he helped to, I think, organize travel for folks who came to um, one of those kind of resort hotels on Camelback Mountain. And so the family eventually skips dad and, and skips mom and his family, and him skipping his sister moved down to Phoenix. And this is like the mid fifties. And so they, they were there for a few years and then they moved to the West coast. And so okay. skip would have been just around the time he's about to, to start high school there yeah, in the west there in the bay 15, area 16 yeah he yeah, did drop right out, of, out of school at 16 too served in the military or did, didn't he, yeah, he was in the navy that's right right he right, right. hey guys quick heads up from the grooming front lines shaving your jewels doesn't have to be a risky business anymore thanks to our friends at manscaped and their lawnmower 5.0 ultra you can forget about nicking your bits this trimmer is all about keeping your things smooth and safe so you can trim with confidence Fancy a stress-free shave and some savings? Head over to manscaped.com now and save 20% off plus free shipping by using the code BOOKEDONROCK. With Manscaped, it's easy grooming and no surprises. Guys, don't be like me. Don't use a cheap razor. Because if you do, get yourself a lot of Band-Aids. It's going to be a war zone down there. <coughs> this fifth-generation trimmer features two interchangeable next-gen skin-safe blade heads. A standard one for taking a little off the top and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. With dual LED spotlights, you'll achieve better visibility, making every trim more precise and hassle-free. And guys, if you're worried about making a mess, don't worry. This thing's good in the shower, in the tub, in the ocean. And if that's not all, it comes in a nice traveling case so you can take it wherever you go. Get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code booked on rock. That's 20% off plus free shipping by using the code booked on rock. Show your balls some love. Feel free as a dove. He wanted to start a band with Eric Clapton. I mean, how close so, was that? Okay, so this is like when we get to the actually the third album session. Right. So okay. the second album they they wrapped on February 13th of 1968. And the second album then was going to come out in April, at the beginning of April. In between the wrapping of the sessions for the second album and the release of the second album, that's when Kate's put out the fake grape, like this other Moby grape. And so now you got this stress that they're dealing with. I found an article, because um, there are very few articles that have uh, interview material with Skip, but there's one that came out in March where Skip is identified as the sp spokesman for the band. And he's talking about how this other grape is not, this is a um, counterfeit grape, he said in the interview. And so um, Skip was, at least when that interview was done, he was like the sort of uh, able to be the spokesman of the band. And then when the second album came out in early April, shortly after that, they start recording demos for what's going to, what they intended to be their third album. And they ended up aborting that project when Skip um, had his breakdown. So from April of 68 until early June of 68, they're in and out of the studio a little bit, recording songs for that third album. And that's, so they, so this happened in April and in May they had a chaotic tour they're like going from one side of the country to the other, like from the West Coast to the East Coast, back to the West Coast, and from the top to the bottom of the country. So they're playing the West Coast multiple times, East Coast multiple times. They go down to Texas. They play up in Cleveland as well. And it it's at the end of that tour that Skip connects with a um, like a, a kind of a groupie. And she she handed a, a note to the road manager. Tim Delera was the road manager. And so Tim got this note and the note said, Skip Spence, Skip Spence, sitting on a fence, which way are you going to go? It's a very odd note. And he, he got this at the, at the perform at a gig that they were playing. And he, he has this note, he's looking at it and he's wondering, you know, what is the, what's this about? This it's almost like a haiku. And he gives it to Skip at the end of the gig. And Skip runs off with this, this lady, Joanna, and Skip is missing in action, kind of like what happened with the airplane a couple of years before. Right. Was that would have been sixty six? This is two years later. 
So Skip is missing in action. Only this time, um, it's a uh, it's a very um, kind of a it's a, it's an unfortunate situation that he's in now. So he they're they're in this like cold water flat in Greenwich Village, and and Don goes to see him. So Don Stevenson goes to visit Skip, and Skip is with um, Joanna, and with Don visiting. And there's an old man who they're referring to as a kind of their oracle. And Skip is kind of being guided to say certain things like Skip, it's it's not really your, your, your time to be in will be grape anymore. Right. And Skip's like, yeah, that's right. And so he kind of falls under a spell with this person. And well, so you say spell, very... was it, wasn't she a witch? <laughs> Was might she... have been um <laughs> okay. again this is like where we get to we don't know for sure but <laughs> right. um she has been uh called that uh by some folks story um, has it yeah yeah and so she i mean we don't know what became of her and so she she kind of had this hold over skip this very happy-go-lucky joyful charismatic person on stage and he he's becoming quite different. And he's saying, I want out of the band at this point. Now, the other thing that we have to remember is that as, as we were chatting about, Skip moved around a lot in his life. And in his performing career, he moved around a lot, right? Like, so he's playing in South Bay, playing folk. Then he goes into the airplane. He also had his own little bands that he was playing in Tahoe in the summer of 65 before he's in the airplane. So he's doing lots of different things. And he's in Moby Grape. So the other thing to remember is that Skip, had things gone differently, he could have had a career where he was like a kind of Jeff Beck kind of person who jumps around from project to project and from group to group and um, is, is doing that constantly and is not content to be in a band for a long time. That's I was thinking about that too, with like how at this point we didn't have a template for bands. Like, you know, there was no Led Zeppelins with a, with a 12 year history at that point. And so people are still making that sort of um, history of bands of what, what is band longevity. Right. And so had things gone differently, Skip could have pursued different projects and different kinds of groups and different kinds of music. Like uh, as a thought experiment, I tried to create a possible scenario where like if things had not gone wrong uh, when he ended up in Bellevue, what could his life have been like? What kind of music could he have been doing? So I could have, you know, he could have gone back and played like uh, folk music. He could have done an album of folk music. He could have done an acoustic album. He could have done um, uh, different kinds of Eastern music. And so he, he could have done so many different things. And so it's not that strange that he wanted to do a different kind of form a different kind of band at that point i mean it's unfortunate because we're talking still moby grapes the 1927 new york yankees but he could have done different things and so yeah he did at one point he was saying he was telling don you know like let's go to let's go to england and form a band we can get eric clapton and everything and so um that was like right before he had his breakdown when he showed up after don visited him and tried to bring him back into the band. Skip was indicating that he wasn't interested in that. And so he showed up just a few days later at the Albert Hotel where they were staying and he bangs on the door of Tim Delera, uh, the road manager, and he's uh, looking for Don. And he looks um, frantic, like he's not wearing a shirt. He's got a leather, leather jacket on, he's all sweaty. And uh, he's looking for Don and Tim knew that Don was in the studio at that time. And from Don's memory, Don and Jerry were recording a song called Texas in the studio at the time, which they later retitled Big. And so they're in the studio and Tim knows they're in the studio. So Tim directs Skip to Don's room because I guess Skip forgot the room number. And Tim directs him to Don's room. And so Skip leaves. And... um he uh, Tim calls the studio to give them warning about what's what's happening here, and uh, like telling him not to come back. Don't come back to the hotel. Skips skips off. Something's going on here, and uh, he calls the studio and he finds out. Oh no, no, they've already left. They they've they've left the studio. They left a while ago, and so Tim's really worried at this point. And Skip had grabbed a um, like a little hatchet, like a little fire escape uh, fire hatchet from the hotel, and so Tim 
really is worried. And so he goes to Don's, Don and Jerry rooms together. And Skip had sort of hacked through the door as best as he could. Tim told me that in those days, there were these kinds of doors that had a little sort of, they were hollowed out in the center. And you there's this little compartment in them where you could hang your clothing for uh, for dry cleaning. <laughs> different world back then and and so it's like a little door for that and you you could keep your stuff there and skip it apparently like hacked through that little hollow area and the door was really damaged and so skip had done that and then went to the studio and david rubinson the producer has spoken in interviews about remembering interacting with skip and kind of talking him down at that point point. and i spoke with michael gruber who was the band's manager at that point and he remembered that too um when skip showed up at the at columbia and he was he was not doing well, and he was not the same skip that they they knew from before, and so he could have been having a, an episode, and he, he was really manic, and so it was shortly after that that he ended up going to the tombs, and then he went to Bellevue, which would have been absolutely devastating for him, being out of the, you know separated from his bandmates, separate his family's on the other side of the continent, his wife and kids, and. He doesn't know when he's going to get out. Maybe he thought that um, he was going to have a quick evaluation and then go out, but he was in for months. Now, Yorma Konkinen from the airplane, I talked to him about it, and he visited Skip actually at Bellevue when the airplane were in town at one point in the summer. And he remembered that Skip was um, like the old Skip when he interacted with them. And he really wondered why with Skip why he needed to be in there. But if if he if he's there in in let's say it's around July August, Skip still had months to go because he didn't get out until November, and so that's at the point when Moby Grape gets sued by Kate's. They're recording. They had put the third album on hold at that point, but they had gone back to the third album, and uh, Skip left and he made his way back to uh, motorbike to actually across the country to uh, California. His uh, wife and kids were in Boulder Creek. And um, with his wife, they got a U-Haul and they drove to Nashville where Skip recorded Or his, um, it's an iconic album. Oh. And uh, that was in yeah. December. You talk about 68. his versatility as a songwriter. That's it. You can listen to that mm -hmm. album and you could you can yeah. hear it. There's, there's so much in there. Was it maybe just an isolated... I'd say but an isolated acid trip i mean maybe it was just that right yeah right. yeah and and uh so we don't know if more damage happens from his time in bellevue and um he he wasn't the same afterwards now he was on meds afterwards and uh, gordon stevens who was in moby grape for the reunion um the granite creek album 20 granite creek stevens was um a musician in San Jose, he had a, his family had a music business, Stevens Music. Later on, he had a studio that he ran. Don Stevenson recorded his first album at Gordon's studio. And Gordon and Skip became chums in um, late 1970. And uh, Stevens recalls Skip getting himself, really got himself together and he was taking his meds. And, and Stevens would drive him up to San Francisco to, to pick up his meds. And... Um, Around the time of uh, Granite Creek, Skip stopped taking his meds and started, you know, what we would say now is like self-medicating. And he was taking all sorts of different things. Um, and um, really his life went off the rails at that point. And his marriage ended, um, the divorce happened in 73. And so that's when really like, um, that's like when I was writing the book, it was very tricky to try and figure out what's going on in, in his life at these different times, because you don't know where is he living, who's he staying with. And um, and so it really it's really unfortunate. He, I mean, on the most important level for his family, like this is this is a devastating thing to have happen. Uh, artistically, you know, music lost a very talented songwriter and performer. And Moby Grape, you know, lost talented um, member of the band as well. And so it's really unfortunate on so many different levels. And Skip really made this album that's kind of his opus, um, or, and he never made another album. And he did contribute to some albums afterwards, a couple of albums. 
but um he he very sadly didn't make another album like he you know in an alternative universe we can imagine what he could have done if he had if he was able to make more albums like Sure. that pursuing different styles of music At the time the album was released, it wasn't received well, but over time, now it's become like a, a I mean, critics praise it. And it's, uh, I mean, it's on Spotify. It's uh, The track Gray Afro is just mesmerizing. I, I mean, and then the, the opening Yeah. track, uh, Little Hands, I mean, it's, Little hands. Yeah. Beautiful. it's just It's absolutely beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. And he's experimenting with things and he's like with Gray Afro, he's playing the drums and it's going through some kind of, I don't know if it's a, what effect he's putting on like a flange or a phaser type effect on it. And, and he's just tapping the bass. It's just, I think it's just his vocals, bass, tapping the bass and the drums. And it's absolutely mesmerizing. And I mean, what he could have done and, and just the, the range of, of styles in that album. It is very sad to, to, Yeah. to think yet he's not talked about, nearly as much and you, you think like sid barrett and uh i think of brian jones guys like that he really should be up there with those guys that an amazing talent that but i think again Yeah. it just goes back to maybe i don't know a lack of a huge hit single that really brought the band into the into the uh more of the mainstream i don't know but it, it, it's strange why do you think not as many people are aware of him Well, um, so Jones was attached to the Stones, and this is like one of the biggest bands on the planet. And, and and same thing with Barrett was attached to Pink Floyd. And so these are like two of the biggest bands ever. And so Skip was attached to Moby Grape. And there's a lot of reasons why Moby Grape, unfortunately, hasn't been able to um, hit the stratosphere. You know, when you look like, as we were saying earlier, you know, you listen to that first album and you think like, why didn't they hit the stratosphere? And a lot of it has to do with that litigation that was going on forever. And I mean, I, one person I interviewed, um, uh, Irwin who put out, uh, who, who put together vintage, which is this collection, this Moby Grape collection. And he, he put together this collection, two discs. He had to kind of make the case to, um, Uh, Columbia Sony that this deserves to be a, a two disc set this is in 1993 so 92 93 so he would have been putting it together in 92 and so like the, the awareness of Moby Grape was really not so much there in, in at that point Vin, uh, vintage helped to give Moby Grape the awareness more of the awareness that they deserve to have But it, that went out of print because, of course, with Kate's, there's always these lawsuits happening. And so that went out of print. They couldn't perform with their name. They couldn't, you know, for years, they, they had to put out albums under different names, like the Melvilles, or they called one album called Live Grape. And so a lot of these things contributed to them not being able to hit the stratosphere or get closer to the stratosphere, not in terms of like the quality of their product, but in terms of commercial like sales. Yeah, the name recognition And, and so... it affected them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, people, Yeah. they couldn't use And and the... so there's also like their songs haven't been used in movies partly because of this. And so, um, yeah, it, it, we Now, can hope that this will change in the those future. two songs you mentioned, the one that Robert Plant covered, and then I think you said everything will be all right, is the, is the other one. There was two, two, two songs that were just great, but they weren't on the second album. Uh, I'm trying to remember what was the first Oh, song. uh, You Can Do Anything. You can do You Can anything. Do Anything was released as a demo later on. The demo So it, version was released. And the other one is called Seeing oh, or see, retitled Seeing. are those two out there that Yeah. people can find them? Are they on compilations? Are they on Oh, deluxe yeah. So edition? uh, Seeing was actually put on Moby Grape's third album. So when Skip Okay. left Moby Grape, um, they they always went... So they they always used songs by Skip on their albums in one way or another. So Seeing was on Moby Grape 69. There's a song that Skip had a, um, a hand in co-writing that's on the album they made after Moby Grape 69. So there's always some of his material on their albums, but Seeing is one of the band's best songs and Yeah, one of I Skip's want to hear best it. uh, songs in terms of songwriting. I got to hear it. Yeah, I put And together you can, the you playlist can do anything for... that came out as a demo. You Can Do Anything was a demo. Mm. Demo only, never fully. Yeah. Okay. Never finished. And it was, it, it would have been fab. Yeah, I put together playlists for each episode, so I'm going to add 
those if they're available because I was putting together yeah. quite a list of stuff that he's he's done. Cam Cobb is the author of Weighted Down, The Complicated Life of Skip Spence. Now, what about the Doobie Brothers? There's guys from the Doobie Brothers that he befriends. I mean, does he he almost works with those guys? I don't think he almost becomes a Doobie Brother, right? Yeah, he's, he's on the credits. He's thanked on their first album. And so Skip was, um, I mean, Skip was kind of a um, mythical figure in a sense in, in, um, in, in, in San Jose, in, in um, the South Bay. And so you have to remember, this is like, um, like people making it in music is like, you know, it's like um, how many people in a town make it into Major League Baseball or the NBA or, or in hockey, the NHL. So it's like making it is a big thing. And Skip made it, right? He was in the airplane and then he was in Moby Grape. Um, the Grape should have had more hits. They certainly had the quality of material there but he made it and so there the doobie brothers are younger and so pat simmons is a young guy looking up to skip at this point and gordon stevens has the music shop and pat simmons knows gordon stevens and then um other guys in the band actually one of them gravitated to the bay area trying to um help um foster a moby grape reunion and this is at the time that moby grape had after the original moby grape broke up which happened in 69. And so Skip was involved in helping them get together. Skip had different bands during those sort of um, missing years between the time that he recorded Or, which was in you know Nashville in December of 68 and the Moby Grape reunion in 71. And so he definitely had a hand in helping the Doobie Brothers get together. And um, yeah, there's a little story in the book about that. Um, regarding the particular a night that was absolutely pivotal in getting the Doobie Brothers together. What's his life like in the 80s and 90s? There's, at so this point 80s, now, he's, he's homeless at, eventually. Yeah, really, and yeah. Um, so Skip is staying in different kind of, uh, sort of halfway houses, and he's homeless at times. He is in and out of uh, mental health wards. And... Um, so he sees his, his sister and his mom occasionally. Uh, he he um, he doesn't see his wife and kids, and he doesn't. So he didn't see his kids for a long time, and he reunited with his kids in the early '90s. And in the '90s, he started seeing someone, and he was moved from a home that he was staying in, and he lived in a trailer like a, a nice little trailer with a, a lady who cared for him. And uh, he had really much more positive time in his last five years. Now, I, you know, I've, I've talked to people who knew him in the seventies and eighties and there were people at one point, Don Stevenson said to me, Skip was loved. And from all the people I talked to, this is really an impression that really jumps out. Like Skip was absolutely loved by the people around him. He left a huge footprint on the lives of the people around him artistically and also um, through his charisma. So his life, though, got much more into a routine from around, say, 95 until um, his passing in 99. Around 94, 95 to 99, much more in a routine. He's taking medication and um, unfortunately he got very sick, right? He had cancer. And he got very sick at the end and he passed away a couple days before what would have been his 53rd birthday. He passed on um, April 16th, 1999. And two days later, he would have turned 53 years old. So that's, uh, you know, it's another part of the tragedy is that um, his life was, was far too short. Can you talk about the story with Robert Plant, October of 93? He, he wanted to work with Skip, but then there was that moment where Right. He doesn't so, know um, it's Robert Plant. Or yeah, no, his brother. Yeah, he brother. always you know, yeah. always Yeah, so his brother, um Rich Young, um his half brother, uh met with Robert Plant, and this was at a show um at a place called I think Bimbo's three six five. I can't remember the number, um, but it was at this kind of like um fundraising event, I believe. And uh the Robert Plant approached the brother, I guess he had seen Skip with the brother and uh, talked to the brother and 
this is around the time that Plant um, first records Skep music. And Robert Plant and Bruce Springsteen are two examples. There are a number of huge fans of Moby Grape and Skip Spence. Two examples are Robert Plant and Bruce Springsteen. And these are two people who are um, performing songs by Moby Grape when they're young teenagers, right at the time that Moby Grape um, is um, ready to explode. And Plant, I think, mentioned something about um, wanting to talk to the brother about some possibilities. I can't remember how the brother uh, worded it. It's in the book. Um, but <laughs> they go into the bathroom. He's like, hey, I got to take a minute. leak. Well, come on with me. And they're taking a leak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the then, but then you wonder, like, oh, if, if things had gone differently, Skip could have been um, involved with, uh, that's when Page and Plant, it was right before Page and Plant um, right. recorded their uh, Unplugged material. And so, I mean, yeah, it, it, you can imagine, like, how things could have gone differently. Yeah. And I think... Omar has mentioned like he was always hoping that his dad could, you know, come back and be a hundred percent, but Skip was um, too damaged really. Like he had from the self-medicating. And so he was really um, not able to come back in the way that he was before, but he was still able to be, you know, talented and still able to be warm. And um, he really reconnected with his, with his kids and, and that's a heartwarming part of the story and that happened in the 90s and that's right at the time that moby grape could have gotten the recognition that they deserve when when vintage originally came out well the family was with him too on the very last day like right up until he yeah that's right breathed his last breath which is a wild story too because he yeah because yeah, so they're playing an album that um there's a cover album that was made to raise funds for Skip. And uh, it features, you know, musicians like Tom Waits and Robert Plants and uh, Beck. And they're performing or actually like so the whole it's like a, a cover of the or album. And it's being played as Skip is um, breathing his last um, breath, actually. And he's listening to these different songs. So. Yeah, it's a, it's. I mean, it's sad and it's also beautiful at the same yeah. time. Yeah, you know what? That's the other thing too, which is is interesting. This X Files soundtrack that he's asked to make a song for, and he does. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, I don't even know how yeah. they were able. It's a to... great song. It's a really interesting song too. It's yeah, it's eerie. I didn't realize he had a really deep voice, very deep uh, mm -hmm. voice. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is called. Uh, well, songs in the key of X was the name of the the album. The song itself, mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember the what was the name of the song? It was left off of the album. Oh, yeah. It's on yeah. YouTube. I I found it there on YouTube. It's um, yeah. it's probably more in the vein I would say of Gray Afro, where it's very uh, atmospheric and mm -hmm. yeah. You know, why they yeah. left it off? I don't know. They should have left it on there, but. Yeah. I can't remember the yeah. name of the song. Yeah, it remember. was recorded in December. I think I think it was December of six uh, of ninety five, if I believe. Yeah. And um the features a member, an ex member of Jefferson Airplane. Um Peter Lewis was there in the studio when it was getting recorded. Um I can't find the name here. Yeah, we can find it. Let's see. Songs there's some, in the key of there's, there's something about the sun. Uh, something oh, about right. the sun is in the name of the... You're right. Uh, Skip, let's see. Skip, Spence, Sun. Land, Land of, the, of sun. the Sun. That's yes. it. Land of the Sun. Yeah, people can yeah. find it on YouTube. I can, I'll put a link to it in the show notes page. So how do you think he should be remembered? Because one biographer said he was a man who neither died younger nor had the chance to find his way out. How do you feel Skip Spence should mm -hmm. be remembered? Well, um you know, something that's important is to, he, you know, Moby Grape and Skip is a kind of partly a cautionary tale, but it's important to recognize the hard work and absolute talent that these guys had. Like these, to be able to write songs and perform songs the way they did, there was a lot of hard work that they all had to do. And so while their story is kind of a cautionary tale in some regards, at the same time, it's important to look at the absolute magic that they had when they were 
writing together and performing together. It's almost like, um, uh, it's like where you're trying to find, um, you're trying to mix things to, to make gold together. Right. And so the, they had that. And for a time they had that and, and skip could even do it on his own too with, or like he had this absolute gold. It was like, he was making gold. And, um, that would be the the way that i think is important is that um you recognize the 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 talent and and the beauty of the the music that they created and at the same time you you can remember that unfortunately had had things gone differently they could have created more of that but um things did not go the way that that they should have well hopefully this book is going to make people aware of of the person skip spence but also the music, the body of work is there. Mm -hmm. There's uh, not as much as we would have liked, you know, all those years that, mm -hmm. uh, that he struggled, but it is amazing to you. I guess it speaks to his, his constitution. He lived quite a long time considering the, the damage he did to himself. I mean, it's pretty impressive. He was a survivor, mm -hmm. uh, 50, mm -hmm. like you said, almost yep, 53. Absolutely. So the book's out April 2nd. And still making the, music. And still making music right up yeah, until. I'm still making music at the end. Too. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, April 2nd, release date of the book through Omnibus Press. Good. All right, Kim. Well, thank you so much. Again, I was looking forward to this episode because this is, I'm always looking to learn. There's always so much that you can learn about. You think you know about all these bands and artists, and there's just so much still left to be told about all these amazing artists. So thank you for writing an outstanding book. Thank you.